Friends of Sing for Science, I'm pleased to announce the launch of our new spin-off series, Sing for Science Labs. This new show invites artists of any stripe, be they musicians, actors, painters, writers, and the like, to come on the podcast and speak with a scientist about one topic of shared interest. Upcoming episodes on labs feature crime writer Patricia Cornwell, physicist Brian Cox, and many more. Don't forget to subscribe to Sync for Science on your podcast platform of choice, and please give us a review. I hope you enjoy the show. This is Sing for Science Labs. I'm your host, Matt White. Each episode in this series brings together an artist and scientist to explore one topic of shared interest. Today's topic is Jungian analysis, and our guests are musician Bethany Cosentino and psychotherapist Lisa Marciano. Bethany is well known as the singer-songwriter behind the Los Angeles-based band Best Coast, and just last year released her first solo album, Natural Disaster. Bethany has been in Jungian analysis for several years and is an avid listener of Lisa's podcast, This Jungian Life, on which three psychotherapists provide dream analysis to their listeners and discuss a wide variety of topics through the psychological lens developed by Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung. Lisa Marciano is a Philadelphia-based Jungian analyst, author, and host of the widely listened to aforementioned podcast, This Jungian Life. In short, Jungian analysis is often used to explore the unconscious mind of the client, placing emphasis on self-discovery and the resolution of inner conflicts. Hello, Bethany and Lisa. Thank you for coming on Sing for Science. Hello. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Glad to be here. I'm going to admit I'm like, Lisa, I'm such a fan. I'm a little starstruck. <laughs> <laughs> See? That's what make these episodes really sing. Um, <laughs> so uh, I just want to start out. I want to kind of get us rolling with this one quote. Uh, Lisa, did you want to say something? I was just going to say, I've never been called a scientist before, so I'm still kind of disoriented yeah. from that. But uh, yeah. How about science adjacent? <laughs> sure. Great. Um, well, I'm glad we're all on the same page here. So I want to start with this one quote to get us rolling here that I came across from Carl Jung, the good doctor himself. He said, we have obviously been so busy with the question of what we think that we entirely forget to ask what the unconscious psyche thinks about us. So hmm. if I hadn't already been sitting down when I read that, I would have had to sit down soon thereafter. So my guess is that's kind of what makes up the foundation of this school of psychology. So I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on that to start our conversation. Either one of you. Lisa, I'll let you go. Okay. Um, I am happy to start. Uh, first of all, you know, it's so interesting because I find myself when I'm talking about Jung coming up with these particular ideas and then being like, that's the foundation of his thought. And I've probably said that about like 50 different things. Huh. And, and it always seems really true. But anyway, it is hard to find like the one idea, but this is certainly one of them. You know, again, a, a fundamental belief in Jungian psychology, which is also true in other depth psychological schools, such as Freudian analysis or uh, psychodynamic psychotherapy, is that there is an unconscious. I mean, there are schools of thought that don't necessarily agree with that. But that is a fundamental belief in my world. And then specifically, what Jung said about the unconscious is a little different from what other thinkers said about the unconscious. You know, for, for Freud, the unconscious was kind of like a wastebasket. It's where stuff went that hadn't come to consciousness yet, or stuff that was repressed, or just wasn't that important, forgotten. But for Jung, it was all of that, but it also connected to the collective unconscious, which he said underlies all of us and connects us all with these primordial images. And and it also could be the birthplace of new creative uh, endeavors. You know, in some sense, every new creation, whether it's a, a book or an idea or a song, 
comes from the unconscious and is a kind of a gift from the unconscious. So if we have this unconscious, if we're walking around and we think that consciousness is all that we are, but really we've got this kind of enormous part of ourselves that we can't see, well, we might want to get interested in that because mm. it's going to influence in the background. And modern neuroscience, you know, as far as I'm concerned, verifies that this is in fact true, that things that you're not conscious of going on in the inner world can affect you. You can be upset and not know that you're upset and then you wind up lashing out at your spouse or something, just as one mm. example. So could we get interested in that? Could we have a relationship with that part of ourselves? And I, I really like the, the quote that you pulled up, Matt, because it, it relates very much to dream work, which is an important part of Jungian analysis. And it's an important part of the podcast because dreams are exactly that. Dreams are what the unconscious think of us. Yeah, that makes sense. Bethany, was all of this kind of, when you first started in analysis, was this all laid out for you? Yeah. I mean, what I would say is listening to Lisa just talk about that, it helped me understand that I think my writing music, particularly the solo record that I made, I feel like when I'm creating, I'm almost in conversation with my unconscious. I feel like it is my unconscious actualizing itself and saying, hey, what about this thing that you have going on in your psyche that you aren't addressing consciously walking out through the world, you know? And I think that when I first went into Jungian analysis, I didn't really know much about it other than like I knew I knew Man and His Symbols. I was like, oh, yeah, I know that book. And I had a friend that was doing mm -hmm. Jungian analysis, and I had been in cognitive behavioral therapy for a really long time. And I would say that it helped me with my anxiety, like it kind of helped me get a hold of certain, you know, breath work and things like that. But I kept finding myself, I was like in a maze and I just kept going down the exact same path expecting to find a way out. And when I went to Jungian analysis, my therapist started talking about these concepts that I was like, I don't know what she's talking about. I don't think I'm smart enough for this. I feel like I need to get out of here. And I very quickly realized that it was the missing piece of the puzzle for me in terms of understanding who I am and creating purpose in my life. And by no means do I feel like I'm suddenly this changed being and I'm like, oh, all of my problems and patterns are gone. But it's about learning. Lisa, as you said, it's like when certain things activate me and I'm like, you know, suddenly I'm angry at this person and I have no idea why. Now I have more of an understanding of the way that my brain works, the unconscious mind, why these certain things might trigger me, why these certain things, why I might see somebody and be like, I don't like that person. I'm able to zoom out and be like, ah, mm -hmm. I don't like that person because I don't like that thing about myself that that person mm -hmm. is, you know, yeah. showing. Yeah. So I have found it to be a thing that in the beginning I was like, you know, once again, I got to get out of here. I, this woman is going to think I'm the dumbest person alive mm. to suddenly being like, wait a second. I actually completely understand this. And it is a necessary element for me in terms of progressing forward as a human being. So what made you decide to try Jungian analysis after, you know, so, so CBT worked to an extent, but you needed something more. Why Jungian analysis? Was it just because your friend was in it or what drew you? My friend had been going for a long time and I would hear the way that she would sort of talk about herself, her, her self-awareness and her reflection of her patterns and behaviors. I was always very like, I found it to be very admirable. And I was like, I don't understand. Like, I don't have that. My, my therapy doesn't help me understand these things about myself. And I think I was just at such a kind of um, a bottom, like I had reached such a bottom in terms of my, I felt like it was like a spiritual bottom, an emotional bottom, all of these things that I was so willing to just try something different. And I will say that I have always been a little bit of a, uh, you know, I, I am, as I've already described many times, like I'm very self-critical, particularly when it comes to my intellect. And I think that I really was like, this is too scary. I'm not going to be able to 
to pull this off, you know? But at that point in my life, I was also really interested in challenging myself and getting out of my comfort zone. And I read my mm -hmm. now therapist's website and she had a little bit of like her bio and she was talking about, do you find yourself repeating the same patterns over and over again and feeling stuck? Do you feel like you can't get out of your own way? And I was like, yes, you just described exactly what's happening to me. <laughs> and I was like, I might as well just give this a shot. And I would say that within about a month, I didn't necessarily start having breakthroughs and whatnot, because I think this is a, a long haul type of therapy and analysis. But I really quickly felt pulled towards, oh, the problem that I've been having in more traditional therapy is that I haven't even been examining these other layers of who I am. It was always this surface mm -hmm. thing of, mm -hmm. well, I get anxious about that thing. And, you know, this person annoyed me because they said this thing to me. But it was never like, why do you get anxious about that thing? Why does that person annoy you? So I just very quickly started mm -hmm. to feel like this is a way that I can start peeling back the layers of who I am. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because I think what you just described is I think the most important part of the analytic attitude, which is curiosity. Mm -hmm. That's the number one tool in the toolbox is no matter what happens, be curious about it. You know, I had this reaction. Why did I have that reaction? You know, the other thing I'll say is uh, we did this episode with Jonathan Shedler, who is a psychoanalyst and um, well, at least he's a he's a psychologist, but he is a very well known, widely published psychologist who's studied and, and looked at the research around psychodynamic therapy versus cognitive behavioral therapy. And I definitely think there's a place for CBT, but we hear all the time that it's the gold standard and all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. But his research is really interesting because it lays out that people going into CBT versus psychodynamic, that's, you know, that's like this Jungian analysis is a kind of psychodynamic psychotherapy, okay? So both groups experienced about the same improvement. And then at follow-up time, whatever, you know, six months later, a year later, I can't remember, this group had held on to the benefit, the CBT group had not. And then mm. when you followed up with them later, like five years later, the CBT group had lost everything. And the psychodynamic psychotherapy patients had continued to improve and what's and this was post treatment and what I think is so interesting about that which is what you've just talked about is one of the things that you learn that becomes a habit when you're in psychodynamic psychotherapy is constant self reflection so that becomes a new way of kind of looking at the world and looking at yourself yeah. and self reflection over time you know it 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 continues to enrich you and help you adapt better to, you know, the exigencies of life. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. There's a quote that I love that I actually, I have all sorts of like little quotes written on post-it notes at my desk. And one of my favorite Jung quotes is, the sole purpose of human existence is to kindle a light in the darkness of mere being. And I find that not only does therapy help me understand myself better, but it also gives me meaning and purpose, what I learn about myself. It helps me walk through the mm -hmm. world and not feel so bleak. Because when you look mm -hmm. around, especially this day and age, it's super easy to be like, well, everything is awful. So why not just surrender to it and go sit on my couch and just turn into a sloth, you know? But for me, it's like mm -hmm. I almost mm -hmm. feel like it it's almost become a form of spirituality for me. It's become a form of a spiritual practice. Yes. You know, when I, yeah. I get excited every week mm -hmm. for therapy and I never felt like that before. Mm -hmm. I was always kind of like, here I go again. I have to mm -hmm. like go recap my week and talk about how I got angry at this thing and I had a panic attack at Trader Joe's and you know, like all of this stuff. And and <laughs> now I look forward because I I take all sorts of experiences and even just the way that I, you know, recognize like the way that the sun shines on the sidewalk and something that like opens my mm -hmm. eyes and just cracks mm -hmm. my head open. I can take that into the office and be like, this is a thing that I felt this week or this is a thing that I'm currently feeling it allows me to, yeah, it, it does. It just, it gives me hope 
for the world. And I never found that yes. in the other type of therapy that I was doing. Yeah. I mean, to me, I think that uh, Jungian thought, it is essentially optimistic. Mm -hmm. And it's also very beautiful. It's a sort of aesthetic belief system in a way. And, and it focuses much more on health and growth than pathology. Not that there's not plenty of dark stuff too. I mean, it, it's not some analog to positive psychology where we're just sure. going to pretend everything's fine, but there is real, there is real beauty in it. And, you know, Bethany, you bring up this, <laughs> again, it's one of those things where I want to say this, this is Jung's really yeah. important idea. <laughs> is this idea of meaning, you know, because he said that uh, pretty much all of his patients that came to him in the second half of life were struggling with a loss of meaning. And he pretty much said, you know, if you have an active faith that sustains you, you don't need analysis. Mm. You know, if you're a Catholic and the Catholic faith means something to you, then just go to church. Mm. But in our modern era, we don't have those grand narratives that connect us to the cosmos, that connect us to a sense of meaning, that connect us to each other. And so, you know, this kind of became the task of, of psychoanalysis. And in particular, it was something that Jung took up, you know, it was it was a really fundamental issue for him. His father was a minister. And one of Jung's really shattering early experiences was uh, as an adolescent to realize that his father had lost his faith. So his mm. father was a minister who didn't believe. Mm -hmm. And this was, this was very disorienting to the young Jung. And in some sense, the, the whole rest of his opus is an answer to that dilemma because he's, mm. he's trying to think about the transpersonal but also to be able to communicate it in a way that he would consider scientific, although he was mm. accused of being a mystic, I think not completely inappropriately. So he's really <laughs> trying to bridge this world of science and empiricism mm. with this sense of that which is greater than, than us. You know, he says the telling mm. question of a man's life is, is he related to the infinite or not? And this mm. is an issue that matters to all of us, whether we can identify that that's what bothers us or not, it is an issue for most of us. And so I think you're, you know, you said it was kind of a spiritual practice. I know uh, Lionel Corbett, I believe, is an analyst who has written about or speaks about whether or not um, Jungianism could be a religion. And I've been thinking a lot about that recently. Someone actually, I was, I was on a podcast yesterday talking to someone and talking about humans need for religion. And he goes, well, what about what about Jungian thought? That's what I always think when I hear you talk is that it's your religion. I said, you know, I, I think you might be right. Because it, it checks a lot of the boxes, right? It provides a kind of an, a grand narrative that connects the individual to the collective and to the cosmos. And that is one of the functions of a religion. Yeah. I think also something that I really love is that when I was growing up, I felt like a lot of my personality was too big. I'm an only child and I was a performer and, you know, all of the, th all of the tropes. And I think that as I got older, I started to sort of try to stuff down like who I was and I was I would walk into a room and be like okay well now I'm in this room so I have to act this way and when I started performing music at a public level I was like okay well now I have to be this way and then I started learning about persona and I started learning about all of these different masks that I would be wearing you know okay well I'm talking to this person now so I have to be this version of myself and this version of myself and I think what happened for me, as Matt said in the beginning, I have a band called Best Coast that I was doing for 15 years and I made a solo record last year. And I think part of why I needed to split off and go my own way and go explore who Bethany is as both a person and an artist is because I became so over-identified with the persona of Bethany of Best Coast to the point where when things were critiqued or criticized, um, if there was negative reviews, I took it so personally as like, this is, well, this is about me. 
they don't like me as a human being. And something that has really cracked me wide open with analysis is the understanding that the persona is not me. It's not who I am, right? Like there's different versions of me and that is a good thing to be able to walk out and protect myself, especially when you're a public figure, you have to be able to protect yourself. <laughs> and I think that had I not entered into this type of therapy and had I not really started to, again, peel back all of these different layers of my psyche and who I am, I think that I would have still been doing best coast and doing the thing and, and yeah, over identifying and just living in this little corner of woe is me. Nobody likes me. You know, I think that having gaining access to understanding that especially what I create is not who I am has been a very helpful thing for me. Mm -hmm. Persona is a uh, Jungian concept, right? Yes, it is. Yeah. And the persona is very valuable. I mean, we all need a good functional persona. It's just helpful to remember that it's just kind of a functional thing that you should be able to put on and take off as needed and not to get over identified with it. Mm -hmm. But I was going to say, Bethany, another concept that I heard in there as you were talking is this idea of projection, mm -hmm. which is an idea that exists, you know, in many depth psychological schools. Jung was particularly interested in it. But I think when you're a public figure, part of what happens is people have projections on you. You know, they they have expectations and ideas about who you are. And the Jungian analyst Marie-Louise von Franz talks about how uh, we actually feel projections almost as, as if an arrow has been shot at us mm. and kind of becomes ours. There, There is some, this is, you know, slightly kind of metaphysical idea, but... I've worked with performers who really bear the projections of their audience and of their followers as a kind of heavy burden. I mean, yeah. it, it's really a weight that one can feel. And so it's very important, I think, when you're a public figure to have some idea about that. Yeah, I listened to your episode on fame, and I related to a lot of what was being discussed. And I think when I was younger, I didn't understand that what people were saying wasn't fact. Like I truly believed I was just like, oh, what these people say is the truth. And then it almost becomes, for me at least, it became a thing of, well, if they say that I'm that way, then I guess I need to be more that way. And it was almost like I would evolve and become more of a version of who the public said I should be. And I would go, you know, like deeper into playing the role. And mm -hmm. yeah, I think that having an understanding that the Bethany that I am when I'm on stage or the Bethany that I am in an interview or the Bethany that I am, you know, whatever it is, when it is pertaining to the work that I do, the music that I create, it's, yes, it is me, but it, there's also like a, uh, yeah, I, I think of the mask sort of as it's like, you know, I, I put it on and then it's almost like it protects me. But I think for a long time, I thought, well, I can't, I can't have that. Like I need to be fully authentic, but also I didn't know who I was. Mm -hmm. So how could I be authentic? You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, yeah. And to, do we ever really know who we are? No, I, I don't. Yeah. I mean, I'm a constant. My mm. opinion is constantly changing about myself. I'm like, oh, I'm this way, but then I'm this way. But, you know, I think also mm. that is something that something that I've learned is all of the parts of myself. None of them are bad. Right. They all make up who I am. Mm -hmm. And I think that I also. Mm -hmm for a long time thought, well, this thing about me is less than ideal, right? And I'm not saying that I find my therapist to like enable my bad behavior. She's not like, oh, yeah, go do that because that's your shadow and that's what you should be doing. But mm -hmm. instead, it's not like mm -hmm. I am a horrible person for thinking this thing or I'm a horrible person for feeling this way or acting this way. It's 
becoming conscious of it and then the integration, right? Like learning how those things can help me. And I, again, feel like for so long, I was like, well, this thing about me is bad and I have to get rid of it. I, I understand now I can't get rid of it. It's part of who I am. Mm. I have to figure out how to make it work. Nor would you want to. What can you tell us about the shadow self? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I don't know that uh, I don't know that I would call it the shadow self, but Jung called it the shadow, and that was his term for it. And it refers to all of those parts of ourselves that we learned were inappropriate or unacceptable in childhood, for example. Sometimes I think about it as uh, most families have a value system where there is like one thing that you absolutely were never supposed to be. So in my family, it was actually boastful. Boastfulness mm. was like the cardinal sin. So I think I sort of came out into the world naturally a person who kind of enjoyed the spotlight a little bit. I'm a second child, and I think that often tracks. So there was friction right there because, you know, I wanted to be noticed. And in my family, that was like, oh, no, 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 that's, you know, that's terrible. Don't do that. But some people, it might be that the one thing you were not allowed to be in your family was um, whiny, you know, and, and, and then you have to be really stoic and, and any sense of kind of neediness, it goes into the shadow. Um, it, it might be that uh, the one thing that you were never allowed to be in your family was um, lazy, you know, that you had to work really hard. And then so that ability to be uh, restful and take it easy becomes a shadow quality. So it's not that the shadow is uh, all negative, although there are some genuinely negative traits that we all have that kind of wind up in the shadow, like, oh, I don't know, greed or aggression. These are the kinds of things that we often stuff down. But the thing is that these qualities uh, accrue tremendous psychic energy because they're, they're off there in the wilderness. And so by the time that we get to adulthood, and especially kind of middle adulthood, it's like there are these unlived parts of ourselves, and they often have a great deal of vitality attached to them. And so, as you were saying, Bethany, not not stuffing them back further, but also not just saying, great, I'm just going to go, you know, yeah. be really <laughs> selfish and greedy. But that integrating them, kind of developing a conscious relationship with them, learning the, what's positive in them or or how that quality could be related to in such a way that it could be a, a net benefit you know, mm -hmm. this is kind of the hard psychological work of uh, dealing with our shadow. It is very humbling, for sure. Yeah. And so it seems like assimilating the, the shadow is a big piece of it. Well, assimilating is, um, is a little bit optimistic. I, I, I don't, <laughs> I mean, Jung said you, you can never really kind of, you know, empty out the unconscious. And, mm -hmm. but, but I think it is more like having a relationship with it, you know, and, mm -hmm. and confronting it. Um, for example, my desire to um, sometimes be the center of attention maybe was in the shadow. And so that meant that it really drove me crazy when I saw someone who was like, yay, look at me. I was like, oh, I hate that person. Um, <laughs> because, you know, she was doing something that, you know, maybe I wished I could do. And that's been sort of a lifelong piece of work. And I'm probably still working on it. But hey, look, now I have a podcast and I have a couple books. And so maybe I don't maybe I'm feeling a little bit better about asking for the limelight. But you know, but I, I still I still have a, a sort of uh, complicated feelings about that. So I'm I'm still working on it. Um, so it's not that I've perfectly assimilated with it, but I have um, met it. You know, it's like mm -hmm. it's a person. It's like I've made your acquaintance. Nice to meet you. Uh, I'm not sure I like you, but let's get to know each other a little bit, and maybe I can have you over for dinner. Yeah. You know, you mentioned this other term, Lisa, psychic energy. Mm -hmm. How do you define psychic energy? Well, Jung felt that uh, energy, you know, was was kind of had its basis in the body, basically, and it was kind of biological in, in origin. But it was just in Jungian thought, psychic energy is diffuse. 
it's not it doesn't take a particular form you know in freudian thought the origin of it is sex drive and so you know in freudian terminology libido means basically your sex drive and you can um divert that into artistic endeavors or something else mm-hmm. like that but really it's it's you know it's sexual energy that was not what Jung thought. He thought there's just this kind of quantum of energy that any one person has. It's kind of life force. I think it shows up a lot of times in emotion. Mm. So when I say to someone, as I do often, what has energy for you right now? Follow the energy, I'll sometimes say to uh, analyzans. And what I really mean is like, what sparks your interest? What feels juicy and alive? Or maybe what do you have a strong feeling about? Mm. Yeah, that's kind of how how I ended up making a solo record honestly. Is that was a big ah, that was okay. a big conversation that was being had between me and my therapist of like when the pandemic hit in 2020, you know, I my band had just put a record out and we were out on tour and I don't need to go into details. We all know what happened. And I was just alone with myself constantly and I was alone with my thoughts and I couldn't do my job and I that's really when I had the big breakthrough of like I'm not a I'm not a person I am best coast like I am this thing this is who I truly believe that I am I feel that my whole purpose in life is this one thing and when it was the ability to go be that thing was taken from me I started just collapsing And I was just like, what Mm. do I do? How do I exist? Mm. And I started to talk Mm. to my therapist about about it, you know, and and she was just sort of cheering me on and was like, the the good stuff is coming. Mm -hmm. Like, this is what we need. This is what you need. You need to shed and understand that you aren't that thing. It's just what you do, right? And for me, it allowed Mm -hmm. me to really understand that I didn't have to stay somewhere that I felt because then I started to really realize like, oh, this isn't sparking my energy the way that it used to. This isn't making me feel as excited Mm -hmm. as it used to. Music still makes me feel excited, but maybe I need to go explore doing it differently, going and exploring being Mm -hmm. a different version of myself, Mm -hmm. going by a different name, Mm -hmm. trying all these new things. But it was so terrifying because it felt like it felt like a part of me, it's so dramatic to say, but I feel like you'll understand. It felt like a part of me was dying, you know? And yep. the moment that I sort of allowed myself to let it die and just sort of sit and mm-hmm. be like, okay, we're, I'm, everything's okay here. Like I'm still standing on solid ground. I just started to follow what was calling me what was giving me sort of that Mm -hmm. libidinal feeling inside of just passion and excitement and i followed it right to nashville and i made a record you know and that's that's really how it all happened is i just let myself Mm -hmm. i really let myself connect with what my soul was gravitating towards and i didn't even really understand it at the time i was just like okay, sure, one foot in front of the other. Sounds good to me. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, what you just described, it doesn't sound dramatic at all to use the (laughs) the dying metaphor because that is what happens. And that is such a powerful metaphor that shows up again and again in fairy tales, myths, and religious symbols. And what you just talked about is the mythologem of the voluntary sacrifice, Mm. which occurs, of course, in the Christian myth that Christ let himself be sacrificed, you let yourself die. You let that version of yourself die so that something larger could be born. It's not just the Christian myth, however. There's uh, all kinds of stories that correspond to that, um, that we would recognize that mythology. So that idea of the... um being connected to these, uh, to mythology, to archetypes. I'd, I'd love to know more about that and like how he, how Jung developed that. And, and also I, I'm super curious about how he came up with this idea that we're all tapped into these archetypes and this, we all have access to these mythologies. 
You know, and I want to point out one other thing that that mm-hmm. really resonated with me. It was either him or his his uh, protege said, "There's a strong empirical reason why we should cultivate thoughts that can never be proved. It, it is that they are known to be useful." And I would put this idea that we all can draw from this common <laughs> yeah, yeah. bank of archetypes in that category. So, yeah, please, I, I'd love to know more about that. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll sort of start there and work backwards. I mean, one of the things that I really appreciate about Jung is he was a real phenomenologist. He just kind of looked at the evidence and it didn't matter to him if, if it didn't make a perfectly beautiful uh thought system that all fit together neatly, it didn't matter. It what mattered was, is it what I see? Is it what is? And does it work? And that goes to your mm. point that you just made, Matt. And, and he says that a couple places in the collected works, like, when you come upon an idea, try it out, see if it works. Mm-hmm. And I, I, mm-hmm. I do think that's really helpful. Because you know, ideas are really powerful, and they can be really dangerous. And there are a lot of bad ideas out there. And so I have this enthusiasm for young, but I also feel really comfortable saying, you know, anything that I find there, like anywhere else, I would take Jung's advice and try it and see if it works. And does it work for me? If it works for me, then it's, it may work for the, the analysians I work with. So this idea of the collective unconscious, does it work? Does it help explain my experience? Does it help explain my experience of myself? Does it help explain my experience of the world? And I think for many people, it's like, well, yeah. You know, it's like what you said, Bethany, I appreciated that you said that at first you felt sort of intimidated. And I think Jung can be really intimidating. There's a way where it's like super intellectual. But I think... I think many people have the experience that you had of just sort of being like, oh, no, this just makes total sense. Yeah. I remember when I kind of found Jung, which is sort of an interesting story, but it was like, oh, my God. Oh, I've just found a document that's written in my mother tongue. I didn't even remember that I spoke it. Yeah. You know, it was it was more like that. So in some ways, it just kind of makes sense. And, and I think, you know, archetypes, sometimes it's like, wow, that's weird. But then you think about it, it's like, oh, no, that makes total sense. So one of the stories about Jung and the collective unconscious, and this is partly how he explains it, but I'm, I'm sure this is a little kind of simple. Early in his career, he worked in a psychiatric hospital in Zurich. He worked there and, you know, there were people with rather severe mental illness there. So there was the one man who was having hallucinations and delusions. And he said to Jung, he said, look out the window, look, look, the sun, the sun has this pipe that hangs down and it makes the wind. And uh, Jung was like, oh, that's strange. And then Jung found reference to something very similar, a very similar image to that, the phallus of the sun that would make the wind in um, Mithraism. And Jung said, you know, there's no way this man could ever have come across that. And, you know, it's been examined and said some people, I think it was, um, um, I can't remember his name now, but someone wrote a book and said, you know, that's not true. And this guy could have read this book or whatever. It doesn't even really matter because at the end of the day, do images of the divine mother show up again and again and again in every single culture? Yes. Does the image of the voluntary sacrifice show up again and again and again? Yes. Does the image of the guardian at the threshold show up again and again and again? Yes. You know, you read you read mythology from far flung time and culture, and it moves you. And you, you recognize the kind of universality of these ideas, and their power to evoke strong emotion. And you recognize that there's a fundamental truth that's expressed through these mythological ideas that we can all recognize. You don't have to be Hindu to have a response to a 3,000-year-old story from Hindu mythology. Mm. It moves you, it touches you, it, it speaks to you, even if it's mysterious why it does so. It's so life-affirming, you know, I think, it, uh, to hear about that, this connectivity. I see it in music. I've mentioned this on other episodes. Paul Robeson, the great opera singer, when he was um, blacklisted, he got into mm-hmm. ethnomusicology and he wrote this whole piece mm-hmm. about the pentatonic scale. And for listeners who don't know what that is, it's a five note scale. So if you just play the black notes on a piano, 
that's your pentatonic scale. And he saw it emerging in disparate cultures, in different music all across history. And similarly, it just really drives home this idea that we are all connected by something purely innately human. Who knows if it's, if it's rooted in physics, if there's a psychic energy that we can't yet measure, like that's an actual tangible thing. Um, who knows? But I, I love what that you said that it, like it really isn't important to, to get down to the granular, how to talk about it, measure it. Mm hmm. Well, it's it is super inspiring to me to recognize that deep, that profound universality. I remember being a freshman in college and I was taking a Western history survey course and one of the readings was the Confessions of St. Augustine. Mm. And I was like, wow, this, this person lived so long ago, but I feel like I'm in conversation with him and he's feeling some of the angst ridden feelings that I'm feeling as a, you know, 18 year old or whatever. It just, it was so moving to me, you know, to recognize that these voices across the centuries speak of these common experiences. And of course, the more I've, you know, lived and read and, you know, the more I, more I see that, but, um, and, and you're right, Matt, it, it occurs in music too. I'm probably going to make a big hash of this, but I'll try it anyway. I have a, I have a friend who's Indian and she was teaching me about Indian classical music. And of course they have the ragas mm -hmm. and the ragas, I think basically correspond to different modes. And the raga that really corresponds to our Western minor mode is the raga that's associated with mournful songs. Mm. Wow. And it's like, yeah. So, so that we hear that and, and something about that minor third. Yep communicates sadness to us. I, I think that's mm -hmm. fascinating. It is. Yeah. This is kind of to, I think what I was getting at when I was talking about how I felt like being in analysis in this way has given me a sense of purpose. It's made me feel connected to like a God that I didn't believe in before because, mm -hmm. and this is one of the huge things is that I have learned over the last five or six years, I think it's closer to six years that I've been doing this, that mm. all of us are just, it's a connection, right? All of us are having, experiencing life differently, but all of us are ultimately having, I, I get honestly like very emotional about it when I think about it, when I peel it back. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll just be out on a walk and I'll see a person standing on the corner with their dog. And I will just feel this like, intense emotion of look at that human just being a human right mm -hmm. and i think that for me that is something that i desperately needed because i was such oh my god i was just the most like there's no meaning to anything like mm -hmm. nothing means anything who cares what is mm -hmm. this place mm -hmm. there's no proof that anything kind of nihilism yes mm -hmm. exactly and this has given me it hasn't turned me into like you know a full-blown like pollyanna of like everything is fantastic all the time but mm. it has given me a language and you're in touch with a living reality exactly it, it's okay that there's no name for it you're just in touch with it every day yep so out of curiosity you said that you originally went to cbt therapy because i think you said you were having anxiety mm -hmm. and panic attacks has have those resolved yeah i don't have I don't have panic mm -hmm. attacks at all anymore. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I, I would say I, I do get, I can get anxious for sure. But I think that some <laughs> of my anxiety, my anxiety now is a lot more of just, I overthink things. It's like I get stuck in the hamster wheel mm -hmm. of, and, and I mentioned this in the beginning, which was sort of the thing that scared me about this in general was that I, my overthinking tends to often be about my intellect. I was always, and I think it's because when I was a kid, I was so good at music and singing. And that was the thing that I was always applauded for. But when it came to like school, I, I wasn't the, the best at it, but I always thrived at mm -hmm. anything that tapped into creativity, anything that tapped into performance, writing, mm -hmm. anything like that. So I think that now a lot of what, causes me to get like, oh God, I'm anxious, is that I'm just stuck in the spiral of, well, mm -hmm. there you go, using that word wrong again. What a, what mm -hmm. a dumbass you are, you know? But now I have this, 
I talk to myself in my head. You know, it's like I can answer these questions and be like, mm -hmm. no, that's not what it is. I do this thing with myself where I say, thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing that opinion with me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> and that is reflective capacity. Reflective capacity. How do you define that? Um, you know, just the ability to, to sort of to self reflect or to what oh, they call it another kind of psychobabble word for it is kind of mentalize to sort of think about your thinking. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, to, to be yeah. curious about about your inner process. Like, what did it, well, I'm feeling in a bad mood. Oh, gosh, I, 10 minutes ago, I started berating myself for using the word wrong, and now I'm not feeling good, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, even it, it's almost as basic as that, but it, it does become kind of a habit mm -hmm. once you've been in, in this kind of therapy for a while, and then you become really insufferable at cocktail parties because you can't make <laughs> small talk mm -hmm. anymore. But. <laughs> In the, in the cognitive behavioral therapy, it was a little bit of like, oh, okay, so I'm stuck in the anxiety spiral. Okay, so now I have to like count to 10. I have to breathe in and count to 10. And sure, that helped calm me down in the moment and I still use those tools, but there's something deeper going on, right? It's not that I'm just randomly this spark of, oh God, oh God, it's triggered by something. I'm activating myself. <laughs> And it's a communication, yeah. right? That anxiety feeling is a communication from some part of you. Mm -hmm. Bethany, I want to ask you this other question about your, your personal history. When Lisa was talking about Jung's relationship to his father having been a, a minister and having a, had a crisis of faith and like you talking about how Jungian analysis sort of awakened this sense of meaning and I, I had read that your parents had a formal relationship in a in a church is that right yeah i was raised christian and that's how that's how i got started in music like i sang at church that was like mm -hmm. where it all started for me so does his mm -hmm. story kind of resonate with you at all and just your path of this the uh, state of awakening you're in now yeah, I would I would say for sure, because I think a lot of once I got older, I started to sort of, you know, resent religion and was like, oh, I don't believe in this. And you guys scared the shit out of me and told me I was going to go to hell if I did this thing and that thing. And, you know, so I very quickly gravitated away. And I think that I didn't have uh, I didn't have any. Yeah, there was nothing to believe in. And I think mm -hmm. for a long time, I tried to trick myself and say that that was OK. I was like, that's fine. I don't need to mm -hmm. believe in anything. But I think that by way of analysis, I have been shown that there is so much to believe in mm. and that believing in something, whether it's believing in, let's just call it a higher power, right? Whatever, whatever you want to call it. Believing that there is something greater than myself is the thing that keeps me mm -hmm. going. And I think that it is something that I have deeply learned by way of analysis. Yeah. I would say that like, mm -hmm. without this deeper understanding of myself and the way that my brain works, I might still be stuck in the, the spiral of uh, nothing matters. One thing that fascinates me and Bethany, you alluded to this earlier, which is that your the process of songwriting is is rooted in a relationship with the unconscious. And I know that Jung from my understanding, cites all these examples of the creative falling into this kind of reverie, whether, whether it's like from dreams or a drug-induced thing like with Coleridge or um, I think he also talks about, uh, I guess Stevenson wrote Jekyll and Hyde. Like there are all these, these instances of creative ideas seemingly coming from out of thin air. I've heard Keith Richards talking about that, about just kind of being an antenna. Mm -hmm. So... I'd first like to hear mm -hmm, Bethany, yeah. just if you could talk in a little bit more depth about what that experience is like, and then hear more from Lisa about what Jung has to say about dreams and how that is a tool. Well, I would say that to really touch on what you just said, like for me, I find that the feeling of something coming down into me and basically suddenly making me feel like where's a pen and a paper i need to pick it up and i need to go write this down or i need to go pick up my guitar and i need to go do this thing 
that in and of itself is as going back to what I was saying before is proof of something bigger, right? Because I can't explain where that comes yep. from. I absolutely am like, right. couldn't tell you. And it's so interesting as a musician, when you do interviews and people ask you like, well, what's your process like? It's like, well, I do it this way, but there's this other huge part of it that I can't really describe to you. I can't really tell you what my process is because I'm not even fully aware of what my process is. You know, it's like, it just gets dropped mm -hmm. down. And I think that as far as dreams go, a huge reoccurring thing for me in my dreams is I am doing something that I am not supposed to be doing but it feels good, right? It's this thing of like, I'm with this person that I'm not supposed to be with and I'm hiding it from everyone. I'm like in the, the room with the door closed and I'm like, oh God, no one can know that I'm here. And the thing that I feel like that is revealing to me, and, and Lisa, I'd love your take, obviously, but I think that something I've really learned about myself is I care way too much what people think of me. I care way too much about doing something that other people are going to think is wrong, doing something that other people are going to be like, well, why, why would she do it that way? And I find that with my, with creativity and with writing, especially with making this solo record, I had to really let go of what are other people going to think because living my life guided by this idea that, well, what other people think of me is way more important than what I think of myself. They know better than I do it it was keeping me stuck and i so i always think it's funny when i when i have those dreams i wake up and i'm sort of like okay let's let's like get in touch with ourselves right now like what are we afraid what are we afraid that we are doing wrong that other people are sort of judging us for and ultimately it just boils down to like the same thing of like i'm insecure that people think i'm not as good as i w think i am or something you know so i i just i find that something that it's all really taught me is my intuition is mine and it is my guiding force. And I don't care what you think about my intuition. I don't care what you think about this decision that I've made. That has been life changing for me. And of course I still get insecure and I'm like, well, I don't know, uh, whatever, you know, neurotic overthinky. Yeah. But ultimately when I really zoom out and I really close my eyes and I get in touch with myself, it's all about, my soul telling me I'm doing the exact right thing. Well, and I would say that that's a really interesting dream image because in addition to the meaning that you've given it, which I think is, you know, valid, uh, on a kind of intrapsychic level, you know, creativity is always a transgressive act. So you're saying that the common denominator in your dreams is transgression. And it is a kind of fundamentally transgressive act because in a way we're stealing something from the unconscious and bringing it into consciousness. Mm. And also there you are in, the, in that one dream example that you gave, uniting with something that feels forbidden. Mm -hmm. So you're connecting with some part of yourself that feels like you're not supposed to connect with it. And often that which is transgressive on a psychological level is that's always where growth is. That's why in myths and fairy tales, for example, it's often a positive thing when someone steals something mm. because uh, you know we're breaking the rules and we're stepping into something that is growthful. Jung definitely talked about the link between dreams and creativity. And you're right, Robert Louis Stevenson kind of had a dream that inspired Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And Bethany, you were talking about your creative process and sort of like, well, I don't know where that came from. Jung would say that that which is creative always comes from the unconscious. So when you write a new song, you should thank the unconscious. When you yeah. come up with a new idea, you should thank the unconscious. And just like you were saying, it's like, I don't, I don't know where that came from. When you wake up in the morning with a dream, <clears throat> most of the time, it's like, oh, my God, I could never have thought of that dream scenario. Mm. Yeah, I would never have thought of that. So just like you were saying, Bethany, it comes from some part of ourselves, it is kind of nightly proof that there is something other than ego in there. And I think that when you start working with dreams and you see that they're not just like really weird, 
but they're also full of beauty and wisdom. Not only is there something other than ego in there, but there is something wiser than ego in there. And that is a pretty astounding thought. For Jung, are, are dreams the only expression of the unconscious? Or does the unconscious manifest in other ways in our lives? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> the unconscious can manifest through like mistakes or, you know, slips of the tongue, kind of mm -hmm. classic Freudian sense. It definitely manifests through art. And Jung was actually quite an artist. And it manifests through fantasies. Jung cared a lot about patients' fantasies and imaginations. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot that comes through that. So, I mean, I think it's kind of always with us. You know, yeah. it, can, it, can, it can manifest in bodily sensations. It can manifest in symptoms. So another big idea of Jung's is that the symptoms that we have, whether it's anxiety or panic attacks or depression, that those are communications from the unconscious, so they're not just something to get rid of. They're something to engage. Yeah. I find that, I think I said this briefly in the beginning of the conversation, but I find that oftentimes when I write, I do, I do feel like it's like my unconscious sort of like gets in the driver's seat and it's like, I'm here now, I'm going to do the thing. And when I listen back, it's almost like I'm having a, a conversation with it where I'm like, where did that come from? I have a tendency to and again i think this is maybe it's persona maybe it's just something that i need to you know that i'm working on with myself but i have a tendency in my personal relationships particularly romantic ones where i will be very uh hardened like i i'm not very good at being romantic but inside i feel this sensation to be this very soft version of myself to be loving and open to intimacy and to be this like, take the wall down and be like, here I am. And I think that with my record that I made, Natural Disaster, it was a manifestation of that version of myself. That version of myself said, the wall is going down and we're coming out and we're gonna just let us do it. And it was the softest, most vulnerable version of myself that I've ever been in my entire life to the point where when the record was being mixed, I would listen to it in my car and I'd be like, who is this person? Who is this girl? I don't know her. Like I only know the very, hmm. the tough, angsty, obsessed with the person that drove me crazy and treated me like shit. Like that's all <laughs> I knew of myself, you yeah, know? Yeah. So I really mm -hmm. believe that my, my creativity is an expression of my unconscious. I think it is like, I have something to say, let me say it. And I heard once that John Lennon said that when he wrote, he didn't even really know what he was writing. It wasn't until he would look back at the lyrics of what he said that he sort of understood. And mm -hmm. I think that that's the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's just like, obviously there are feelings, emotions, experiences within us that are wanting to come out. And I think when you just sort of allow them, you just sort of, say again, mm -hmm. like, okay, I'm going to get out of the way and let whatever comes out, come out. I do feel like that is your unconscious saying, let me actually reveal to you what you really feel. And I do think that mm -hmm. below the surface of the hardened exterior, there is a very soft and gentle person inside who's just scared, right? It's, it's fear. Mm -hmm. It's a fear of being swallowed and squashed and abandoned and all of the things. So I really do believe that the unconscious, it, it will show up when and where it wants to show up. <laughs> no, absolutely. Called or not, God will be present. Yeah. You know, um, I, I want to hear more about dreams, but something just occurred to me. It's like, what did Jung have? You'd mentioned, Lisa, that he used to work at a psychiatric hospital with people who were severely, I don't know if you would describe them as disturbed or incapacitated mm -hmm. with different disorders. And so it would seem to me like a lot of analysis, people who are most ripe for it are like the three of us who can kind of articulate what we're feeling. There's a self-awareness, you know, a, an emotional intelligence, but like, what if you're totally dissociated from reality? How would he apply 
his philosophy and his toolkit to people like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I mean, to a certain extent, you know, to do the work, you know, as we've been describing, you do need to have a pretty good ego. Mm. In some sense, again, back to what I said in the beginning about I can sort of boil it down to about 50 different one line sentences. But one of those would be the work of Jungian analysis is kind of creating a dialogue between the ego and the unconscious. Mm. So in order to have that dialogue, you kind of have to have an ego. Mm -hmm. Uh, So what about people who don't really have a strong ego? Well, it's interesting because um, Jungian psychology is one of the approaches that there is a history of treating, for example, psychosis analytically, and that would involve taking the hallucinations and delusions of psychotics and assuming, this is back to your question, Matt, that there is meaning in them, which I think there is, you know, I think that a hallucination is a product of the unconscious. And so, you know, modern psychiatry would say, well, the content doesn't really matter. That's not interesting. And so the typical way that you're taught is don't engage the patient's hallucinations. But if I'm working with someone who's had a hallucination, I am thinking about it almost like it's like a dream and that it might have a symbolic meaning. And I think that can be, let's say there's some utility in that approach, Mm. but I don't want to take that too far. It really, it really depends. And you, you certainly need an ego to function in the world. Sure. So, you know, the, the thing about Jungian thought is it can kind of go in this direction. And, and I've, I've had people do this where all they want to do is come in and talk about their dreams and that that actually becomes a way of avoiding adapting to the outer world. So Jung Jung said, you know, before you do this deep psychological work, you have to be able to bloom in the ground in which you were planted. You have to be able to adapt to your situation. And that is the task of ego. So I think it's kind of a both and But I don't want to say, well, yeah, we can just take um, anyone with psychosis and just cure them by treating their their psychotic material as if it were, you know, a symbol system. You know, Mm. I I think there's some literature about that, and it's Mm -hmm. very, very interesting. And and I've done some of that work myself, and I wouldn't go all in and say that that is always the answer or even the only answer some of the time. Yeah. So, Lisa. I would love for cuz I think I think it was something that would be really interesting to talk about is ego. The word ego I think to most of society is a bad thing. It's like, oh god, like you don't mm-hmm. want to be egotistical. You don't want to have a big ego. And this is something that I'm still trying to learn and understand because I do often be like, oh, that's just my ego. And my therapist is always like, you need your ego. Your ego is good. Like, you know, and I'm like, it is, but I've been told it's bad all this time. So I'd love to hear you just sort of wax poetic on the ego and why it is so important. And, and yeah, helping people and listeners understand that what we think of as the ego is not necessarily what Jung thinks the ego is, correct? Mm -hmm. You would say maybe? Yeah, well, I I mean, I can wax. I don't know how poetic I'll be, (laughs) but... um... (laughs) You know, the the ego, you can think about it as a kind of function. Mm -hmm. And it it develops, right? Babies don't have egos, but it develops, it kind of coagulates. And it's that sort of sense of I. So when you tell a narrative story, it's like, well, I went to the grocery store and I bumped into an old friend. And, you know, like the I, that's your ego. It's that sense of like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm... I'm Lisa and I'm in my 50s and, you know, I, uh, I, I'm I a vegetarian or whatever. It's just that it's kind of that sense of personal continuity. Mm-hmm. But it has a very, very important function, which is to relate to the outside world. So, for example, it's tax season and I have to go start dealing with some tax issues. And my ego needs to be on board with that because... You know, that is a taxing thing for me to do. So I'm going to have to have my executive function skills and I'm going to have to remember where I put that piece of paper and then I'm going to have to find my password so I can log into this or that account. And that's all kind of the ego. Mm -hmm. But also the ego relates to the inner world. So when I get absolutely bulldozed by a big feeling, it will be my ego that says, whoa, what was that? 
okay, uh, let's see, what do I do with that? You know, am I going to say something or am I going to just uh, sweep it under the carpet or what's the best way to handle it? The ego would deal with the images that arise in a fantasy or the images that arise in a dream. So if I'm having a persistent fantasy, a few a few months ago, I was like, oh my God, I want to climb Mount Kilimanjaro, which just like came out of nowhere. I was like, yeah, I'm going to do that. <laughs> so my ego's going, hmm, <laughs> I wonder what that's about. And I wonder, you know, is that something I actually want to do? And if I do want to do that, what would that look like? But I can kind of hold it as an inner image for a while. So in, in some sense, it goes back to what we were talking about before, you know, Bethany, when you said, thank you for sharing. I was you know, just going like to ask you. Your ego, <laughs> yeah, your, your ego is kind of the head of the table yeah. in that conversation. The ego is not the only voice at the table, but the ego is probably at the head of the table. Mm -hmm. And so it's very important to have an ego and what it looks like to get for the ego to kind of get swallowed in the unconscious is psychosis. I mean, that's exactly what Jung said, that, you know, kind of dropping down into the unconscious, he says, you know, this is dangerous, because you might not come back up. Mm. And if you have a relatively strong ego, most of us, most of us come back up, but Jung almost didn't, you know, he had this period of his life that he called the confrontation with the unconscious, and he went pretty far down. In fact, the psychoanalyst Winnicott thinks that Jung actually had a psychotic break at that point. So Jung was very protective of the ego. He said, you gotta, you know, you gotta hang on to it and you gotta protect it. And it is consciousness too. Yeah. Consciousness is that which is in the ego's kind of light. Thank you. That, that was poetic, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> uh, it's, it would seem that he also talks about, from what I've read, that pride and uh, I forget, I, it's the Latin root of hubris comes up for mm -hmm. Jung, right? So I'm glad Bethany brought that up because distinguishing between ego and pride, I'd be curious to know just really quick what he has to say about pride, how that figures into analysis. Well, I mean, pride in the sort of everyday sense of like, I, you know, I met this challenge and I feel pride. I'm proud of myself or mm -hmm. I'm proud of my kid because they made the soccer team or whatever. You know, I think that that's, an, that's a sort of ordinary kind of feeling. I, I wonder if, if you're talking more about hubris and Jung yes. would put that in the category of inflation. So mm -hmm. an inf a psychological inflation is where the ego kind of identifies with an archetypal energy that can feel wonderful, but it can be, you know, very, very dangerous. So um, let's say that we're, we're falling in love and someone thinks that we're really just beautiful and we have this actual kind of change in state. We experience ourselves totally differently because we're kind of experiencing ourselves through the projection that this other person is putting us and we actually feel like Aphrodite. I mean, that can feel really wonderful. Inflation, we, we might think of certain political figures that I won't name. When the emperors were being, what do they call that? A, you know, crowned or, you know, the coronation of the emperors in Rome, the emperor would ride along in his imperial purple and there would be a, a slave in the chariot with him who would whisper, remember you are mortal. Because otherwise, all those cheering throngs would make the emperor think that he were not a mere mortal. So we're always in danger of becoming inflated. And when you talk, when you say archetypal energy, you met, you mentioned Aphrodite. Was is that an example of that? Yeah, yeah. So okay. so any of the any of the kind of you know classical gods and goddesses, or um, they don't just have to be Greek. Greek, they could you know, be it from other mm. symbol systems. But, you know, the, the gods of the different religious pantheons are examples of archetypes. Mm. Well, splendid. Thank you for both for being so generous with your, <laughs> with your time and also your personal experiences, you know, because I know you're both speaking about your individual struggles and paths in mm -hmm. development. So it's very generous and I appreciate you doing it for the show. Thank you so much. That was so wonderful. And Lisa, I'm again, I'm such a fan of your work. And it was so cool to get to have a conversation with you. Yeah, I really enjoyed this. Thank you. It was lovely, uh, 
Lovely and, yeah, getting to know thanks, you. Thanks, Matt, so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Be sure to check out Bethany's solo album, Natural Disaster, and Lisa's new book, The Vital Spark, Reclaim Your Outlaw Energies and Find Your Feminine Fire. Sing for Science is co-produced by TalkHouse and made possible in part by a grant from the Simons Foundation. Our music is by Panoram, social media manager is Bailey Constis, and digital producer is Keenan Cush. If you like this episode, the best way you can support us is to give us a review, tell a friend about the show, and subscribe on your podcast platform of choice. For more information, go to singforscience.org and follow us on social media at Sing for Science. Thanks for listening.